Welcome to the Pool Chasers Podcast. I'm your host, Greg Viafania, joined by my co-host, Justin Bowie. What's up? And today, we got a real one with us, Mr. Dan Waters of Creative Environments. How you doing? I'm doing well. Pleasure to be here. I'm excited to be here. Dude, we are beyond excited to have you here. I've said this before, but you are one that I have definitely been asking Justin, have I not? He has, yeah. I'm like, what's up with that, dude? Because we saw you at 4 till 4. You probably didn't remember, but I saw you at 4 till 4, and I'm like, there he is. Can I ask him? <laughs> can, I, can I ask him? Be on the show? Um, but yeah, just super excited to have you here. Thank you. I'm, I'm usually uh, pretty low-key and, and behind the scenes. I've got a lot of great people. I would tell you, even before all this, this goes, I've got, uh, man, incredible staff of people that have been with me, some of them 35 years. Um, with this industry and it's it's not an easy industry for some people to, to stay in but uh i've got an incredible staff of people from top down bottom up the men in the field uh the guys swinging the pick you know pushing a wheelbarrow um doing marketing accounting design uh everything that we do um just uh really really great people so i'm probably here because of them i'm super blessed that's awesome yeah. And I mean, we had lunch at the yard last week just to kind of get to know each other a little bit better. I know you've known Justin for a long time, but just hearing your story, um, I'm like, holy shit, that's not what I expected. Um, I just think people are going to get a lot out <clears throat> of it. But before we dive into that, we got to do our beer sample. We got just beer this week. We had Rick and he had some bourbon, which is hiding over there in the corner. Is it? Damn near that. empty. I got to um, take that home. Yeah, but we just got beers today, so we're going to snatch up some beers. Which one of these Yeti bags? This yellow one? Yellow. It's a pretty yellow one? Okay. Dan brought his own Yeti. He did. He got that gray joint. I tried to follow direction. Mr. Bowie <laughs> gave me some pretty clear direction. <laughs> Don't show up empty-handed. Well, cheers, gentlemen. Yes. Cheers. <clears throat> where, where, did, where does this beer come from? So that comes from Trevor's, right? Was this a Trevor's run? Yeah. Shout this out is to a our... Trevor. Trevor's. Cheers. Cheers. I mean, they know me over there now. Say, oh, you got another podcast, huh? All right, let's do it. <laughs> Load up that shopping cart. All right, so I'm going to take a sip of mine real quick. Oh, man, just as beautiful as I remember it. So this is Ale Smith Speedway Stout, and this is a mix of um, kind of like a Guinness Stout and coffee, Good but God. it is amazing. Wow. It really is. It's not a combo I would normally drink, but um, I've said this before on the podcast that this is one of my favorites. All right. So Ren House Brewing. I'm always about some Ren House Brewing. So today trying, I guess you're going to pronounce that Hell's Style. Would you say Hell's Style that? Sure. Yeah, yeah that sounds good. good. So you, you started the scale system. What is it? Yeah. So this is my second beer rating, right? So last mm, week was six. This is a little, this is a little hoppy for me. I'm going to, I'm going to go. Six six, again. What, what, was, that, what was that last week? What am I supposed to ask for? Like, do you have a, the non hoppy section? I think what it really boils down to is I can only drink Valley beer. I think at this point, <laughs> okay, I think that's what's going on. But no, six six, it's good. Okay, a little hoppy, but it's good. And what you got over there, Dan? The one that you brought. Yeah. So one I got is uh, the Shop Beer Company, introduced to me by a friend, a uh, good friend, and it's uh, called Church Music. Uh, church music. Yeah, it's so good. It's so good. Not not really a beer guy all the time, but. You know, if there's one you just want to relax and have and enjoy, it's a, it's a great one. Dude, that is a, very good. That can is rad. I dig that. It's a swanky yeah, it's can. Pretty good. All right. Our man Mike over there, what you got? I've got an uh, Ecliptic Brewing in Portland, Oregon, uh, to Kana's Tangerine Sour. And um, it's like a, a warhead my kid gave me one time. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, Dude, I'm so sorry. I didn't know oh, what no, to good. expect when I got that. No, no, no. It's good. I'm excited. <laughs> If the camera was on mic right now, I think you could see that. <laughs> Tastes like shit. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Good stuff. We got the beer sampling out of the way. Right on. Well, let's fire this thing off, huh? So, Dan, yeah. I guess for, you know, obviously you and I have had a relationship forever, so I think I know a lot about you. I did learn some new stuff in our last meeting, but why don't we start? You can tell everybody kind of where you started, how you got into the business, and kind of how you got to where you are. Okay, and I'll, I'll, I'll try and condense it too because I, I could talk forever about it. Just uh, so many cool stories as I kind of go, my mind goes in and out of different memories as uh, you know, I went through it. Um, it's not uh, probably your traditional story, but uh, 
you know, if I, if I go back a little bit further, I was uh, a young kid. I was working fast food. I was working fast food, probably $3 and I think it was $3 and 35 cents an hour. And my brother, it's a summer job. My brother said, hey, this, this project, my brother was in construction and he was a couple years older than me. We're young, young men. And uh, he was working construction on this project in, it's up on Squaw Peak. And they were building these um, smaller lots, but really well done homes for the time. And back in the time, you go way back, Miami Vice days, a glass block was everywhere, it was everything. It's so old, you know, old in architecture anymore. But uh, the back of the house was all glass block, a ton of glass block on the house. And they needed to build a swimming pool. And the, the area was just solid rock, but they didn't want to bring in big equipment because the, the house was done and they were working on you know exterior stuff. There's still finishes on the interior that, that needed to finish, but they're still working on the exterior. And they needed us to come in and manually jackhammer a swimming pool. And back then, diving pools, everybody did. So this was a diving pool through solid rock. And my brother tells me they'll pay me five bucks an hour if you know I'd come join them as just a laborer on a construction site. I'm like, man, five bucks an hour from 335. That's a huge increase, right? You know, that's, I don't know, 60 bucks a week, 70 bucks a week. Um, so, you know, I took the job and we began to jackhammer a swimming pool through solid rock. Uh, it took us a couple of weeks to do it. We did it faster than I would think that anybody would do it today. But uh, we got in there with jackhammers and jackhammered out this pool and we had to carry the wheelbarrow up out of the pool across a wash so we had plank boards to carry our wheelbarrow across the wash and dump stuff on the other side so they could haul away the trash or the all the spoils um and i continued to work on the project and as i was hustling uh they would show me more um a guy came out one day and just told me where to dig ditches and i dug ditches and he came out um you know later that week and he started throwing down throwing down pvc and he'd throw the fittings into every you know hole and joint and so i started learning how to do you know pvc and um, kept going, but uh, semi shows up and plants showed up. And all of a sudden I watched these environments come together like, wow, this is really cool. And it really hit me emotionally of, you know, not the job that I was doing, it was, it was hard work, but uh, it was also satisfying. I, I didn't grow up that way. And to see these really beautiful model homes being built and the design of the exteriors was like nothing I'd ever seen. And again, I'm construction labor. So my sister starts dating a guy and he comes over to the house one time, first time I meet him, and he says, yeah, what do you do? And I tell him I'm construction labor. Oh, what do you do there? And I, I share with him what I was doing. And he says, oh, you're in landscape. I didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't know what really landscape was or landscaping. So it was kind of foreign to me other than, you know, you push a mower. Um, so he recruits me and for seven bucks an hour. So I went to seven bucks an hour and you know, still a young man, uh, but you know, I'll, I'll, I'll work hard for the cash. So they, you know, for, again, I'm, I'm back, uh, I'm digging ditches, I'm swinging picks, I'm pushing wheelbarrows, I'm doing all that stuff. Um, working with these guys, they were, they were rough on me cause I was, I was the, I was the white guy, you know, on the project. And that was, that was pretty normal. Um, but I wasn't going to let anybody beat me. I was, I was driven to be better than them. Um, I may not know as much as them, but they weren't going to outwork me. And so you know, soon they started to take me under their wing. They started to teach me, teach me how to use the tools, um, why I was doing things. Um, I, I started to learn a lot from them. You know, and if you, in, in my day, if you didn't work hard, um, you're probably cast aside. And, but if you could show you had work ethic, you got respect. And w which was really important to me just to, uh, to show them that they weren't going to outwork me. Um, I started to advance with the company a little bit. And, and I think I shared this story with you guys. Uh, my, so his name was Chuck. Chuck became my partner later. But uh, Chuck asked me one day, hey, I've got a project with a client. They want some stuff in their backyard. Just go take care of them. So I go. Um, I listen to the client. I look at what they want to do. I talk to them about what we could do. Um, I, I put everything together. And I asked, my, uh, I asked Chuck. He was my boss at the time. You know, you know, what do I charge? And he tells me, and I don't even remember what the how much it was, but uh, he told me what to charge. And so I went on a Saturday and I did the entire project. When I finished the project and I got paid, I probably made more money that day than I make in a typical week. And I was like, wow, this is, huh, there's something to this. And 
Um, I was always a little bit of an entrepreneur. Um, fast forward, uh, Chuck's father owned the company. It was, it was established in 1950 um, over in California. His father followed in 1970 Del Webb over to Arizona and began working in Arizona. Um, his father was, was a little bit older, and this is probably now fast forward into the very early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. Father wanted to step back from the company, um, and they were processing. It, it, there was a little bit of a recession that had hit then, so 87 was a recession that went into like the 91, 92. Um, but his dad wanted to step away, and Chuck wanted me to partner up with him in the sense of being his kind of right hand. And I was so motivated. Now I'm, I'm 24 years old. I'm really motivated to grow a business. And that's just how I thought. Um, not normal for maybe a 24-year-old kid today, maybe except for Justin. But <laughs> uh, I remember meeting Justin. Um, but I, I really want to do it. So he said, well, you know, my parents will never sell it, but you go talk to them if they want to sell the company or part of it to you, you know, negotiate it, which I did. So I negotiated to buy half the company from his parents and over a seven-year period paid off my half of the company to his parents. Um, so I uh, had bought it. At the time, we were really small. We were like six men. And uh, we grew and grew and grew. Um, we grew up through, if you go into 04, 05, 06, there was a real big boom in construction at that time. Um, we had about 700 in-house employees, so the company had really grown to, to quite a few people. Um, a lot of trucks, a lot of equipment, a lot of overhead liability, all that stuff. We didn't we did okay, but we didn't do well. We weren't executing as well as we needed to. Um, we went through the recession, 08. We survived that, uh, you know, really, you know, it, 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 tough times. Um, every day focused on everything that we had to do. Um, worked really hard, nonstop, very disciplined, dedicated. Um, sacrificed everything. Sacrificed everything to make sure that our people were taken care of, we could pay our debts, um, and we could keep the company going and just, you know, you believed in it. Unfortunately, my, my partner passed away in, in December of 2010. He was, he was senior uh, to me. He was pro probably 11 years older than I am. And uh, he passed away, unfortunately, and I then bought out the other half of the company uh, from his wife. And that was a you know, 2011 timeframe, and so carry forward today. So sometimes I'll refer back to kind of 2011 as a time in my mind of when my life changed very differently, um, but you know, ended up buying out the company. And, and my wife and I still super disciplined to pay off our debt, um, you know, everyone, everything, and really you know, put money away to where we could build a different company that would have you know, some type of significance to our people, um, to our clients, and you know, eventually you know, allow us to do things that we wanted to do in life. Um, so you know, part of my story where we're at today I don't know. It, we we contract differently. Um, headcount is probably just under 200. If I take the outside subcontractors we work with, some are solely dedicated to our company um, because we have that much work. And in other areas, um, subcontractors have have had that, but they've also grown their own business, and so um, they work with other companies. But there's probably a count of about another 400 outside of our our core 200 that are within the company. Um, we have a really heavy focus up front in design. Design is something I'm super passionate about. Uh, there was a period in my career that I, I sat at a drafting table at least 80 hours a week, sometimes 100 hours a week, and for six years, almost nonstop, that's all I did was draft, measure, design, um, detail, breakdown, and, and figure a lot of things out. But I'd, I'd been in the field long enough to know um, how to apply that skill set towards the drafting and the drafting which becomes you know the design then you have to execute the design um, but that's something that we've done it's probably a little bit different than some of the other pool contractors in town is we have a very heavy um, intense presence you know in design um, we probably have 40 people in our company that are dedicated up front just to the, des the design of projects from the drafting the uh, the, the CAD work, the, um, the rendering, the 3D, uh, the 3D fly-throughs, um, people who do the presentations, people that project manage from the presentation point forward. Um, there's a lot of people dedicated just to that side of a business. So 
Um, you know, some people are waiting for the phone to ring. They go out, they meet with a client, they sign a contract. Ours is a very different process. It's as if you hired a landscape architecture firm to come into your home, your business, or if you're a big builder, you've bought a community and you're looking for the vision of how are we going to develop the community, and we help do that um, on entry level up to you know very high levels. Um, and some of our design has gone, you know, all around the country. We've gone to Kauai, Costa Rica, Virgin Islands, um, Cabo San Lucas, um, you know, Texas, Florida, Arizona, California, all over California, uh, Colorado, Utah, um, and different projects in different areas, Wyoming. Um, and we'll do design, and we've gone out and executed on some of it or done project management on some of it, or it's just the design services that we'll sell. But that's a big part of our business that I think makes us a little bit different than most of the companies that are out there that are more focused on the, the construction of out, all things outdoors. Um, and we do that. We do all things outdoors. So, um, And when did you get into pools? Hmm. Pools? This, somebody asked me this yesterday. Uh, somebody just asked me this yesterday, and um, the kind of the difficulty of transitioning from landscape into the pool business. So we had always been part of the pool design process. Um, we were a main subcontractor for most of the big pool companies in town. And and if you go back in the you know the the when the market was really crazy, I think that like. Paddock pools, uh, the Giz family, great guys. Uh, they were probably 2,500 pools a year. Uh, the Ast uh, family, the Shasta was 3,500 pools a year. This is back in the peak. Um, California pools was way up there. Um, all, the, all the top probably five, six, seven pool companies, we were a major subcontractor for the, for the pool contractors. So we knew all, th all things outside the shell, but we didn't know the dig plumb steel, uh, shotcrete, equipment set, electrical gas runs, waterline tile, interior finish. Those were kind of those, those maybe less than 10 components or plus or minus that we had to figure out. But being somewhat intimidated by it and because you had some big companies that were doing the pool construction, things like that, we weren't quite ready to do it. Plus, we would kind of bite the hand that feeds us. If we went into the pool business, all of the business revenue we were getting from all these companies because our fax machines, the days of fax machines and it just ran all the time with new pool project, new pool project. So we would go in the backyards and do a lot of things that were outside the pool shell, waterfalls, decking, um, benches, barbecues, you know, uh, turf, grass, plants, trees, all those things. But the, uh, uh, the pool was a little bit intimidating. And we started to look at where the business was. Why was it intimidating? Probably two points. You don't want to fail. If you fail on, a sh on an entire pool, you know, the cost to rip out a pool and redo it, that could be very expensive. And you, you, you know, screw up on three, four, five pools, that's a, that's a lot of money. You're into, you know, hundreds of thousands or more. Um, but also because it would completely risk everything that we had built in our business, was, which was being a major subcontractor for the pool companies. But when we looked around the, the, the big picture where we didn't have control of the process, the process we felt could be better, and we knew it could be better. You know, oftentimes, you know, you may have a guy uh, that's in the pool industry, and he's going to Mr. and Mrs. Smith's home, and he just got in the industry. He's gone through, you know, three months of training. He's going to Mr. and Mrs. Smith to design a pool. The placement of the pool isn't really proper. Design of the pool doesn't fit the flow. Um, we would see just so many errors and mistakes in how that was designed because we would then get the plan. We would have to design everything outside the pool itself and present it to the client. And things wouldn't always work and fit. But if you could take the entire project and look at it as a whole and make sure the pool fit to the space and it served the client and their family for all the things that they wanted, um, it became much easier and it worked better and the design was better and the process was easier and faster. Um, again, we were used to, we would get a notice that a pool was sold and it's going, it's going to be dug and we would usually put it about six to eight weeks out on our schedule of potentially where we might start the project. Um, 
you know. What did you design first usually? Was it the pool or the landscape? It, it really depends on, there's, there's like a million factors. It, it's, it's like playing chess, you know, which, which piece do you move first? It's not always the same piece, or at least, you know, if you play. Because um, I know one has to they, affect the other. They all have to tie in together. They all have to balance. So sometimes you're designing, maybe it's that, that patio <clears throat> extension that they want, and they want it to be at least 20 feet out, and where that patio is going to finish starts to set up where a pool might sit, but all of a sudden the size of the pool they want has to move a different direction. And instead of going um, linear through the yard, it's going to go horizontal through the yard. It's going to go a different direction. So um, every single product, we have no templates. Um, I know a lot of pool companies, they have templates. They can actually look at a template of a pool and they can copy it and they can put their deck around it. Um, I won't allow a template. You gotta learn how to design. It's gotta be fresh. Everyone has gotta be new. It's gotta be different. Um, you know, try to pride ourselves on creating new design is, is really important. So, to, I don't know, to answer the question, which, which piece comes first? Um, usually, it, what they call bubble drawings, a lot of times you start out with just giving kind of an area of where the pool's going to be, an area where there might be a gazebo. We know we want a fire pit maybe out the master bedroom. Wait, I want a, I want a, a, a spa over in this area instead so we're going to start to move things around and you kind of get a general feel of space planning and area and then you start to combine all these things and uh, they just start to come together when it's right you know it's right um, it fits you know you've got a good design when you're really forcing it uh, sometimes it's it's difficult or you know i'll take paper and i'll just shift it 180 degrees and look at it differently and you find a different approach of you know how you want to design but uh, you know, as we went through that, that whole process, we, I remember we studied for about two years. We interviewed uh, the equipment manufacturers and, and all had a really good, I would tell you one thing that was great about the pool industry that we found different from the general landscape industry. General landscape industry, super fragmented. Uh, the pool industry, you had really great trades in excavation um, in plumbing, to me, that's the most important. I've always said it from day one. It's the heartbeat of the pool. You don't have a heart in that pool. Is there a plumber you like or for pools? Yeah, but he's so busy, so I use J Max. <laughs> 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 nice. No, Justin is. Uh, um, our, I think our, our relationship goes deeper than just business. Um, there, there's, uh, you know, if I, I, if I told you the number one thing for me in doing business with people is you trust them. You can't trust them. Don't do business with them. And unfortunately, some days there are people you, you can't trust and you, you're, you have to do business with them, not that you want to, but because there isn't another resource that's good or available. Um, you know, there's a lot of different reasons there. But number one, if you've got somebody that you find that you trust, uh, that is absolute number one. Nothing else, you know, rides above that. And that, that goes for all the people in my company. You know, if I trust the people in my company, we can do anything. Um, if you can't trust the people that you're doing business with um, or the big builders that I do, I got some frick great, great builders that we deal with right now. Um, how did you guys meet, by the way? Well, how did we officially meet? Or, or I guess it goes back further than when I actually physically met Dan. Dan and, Dan and my father worked together. My father was a VP for Toll Brothers in the Arizona division. Mm -hmm. And I know he knew Dan through through the relationship between uh, home building. But I guess I don't know how you met my father, actually. I there, there, was, there was somebody we knew who referred us into a project. And we did the first project successfully uh, with your, your father's company. And we did a few more projects and started to make a name for ourselves. We were able to do larger projects faster, execute, and we're really excited to work with them. But I, I actually think I, I worked for your father for a number of years before I actually met him. But mm. I do remember the day I met your father. Um, I, I don't even know I want to go there. I'll cry. Uh, <laughs> I really will. He's uh, there was a gentleman I was working with um, that called me one day and he said, "Hey, my boss. This was Justin's dad, and I had not met Justin's dad. I'd only heard about him. Uh, highly respected, but." doesn't mess around. And he said, uh, he wants you to come walk him on the project. This is shoot, like 25 years ago or something. Um, big project, big project, big numbers for us at the time. And 
I was so nervous and I went and I painted everything out on the ground, what we were doing, because we were, we were underway on the project and he wasn't sure what was going on. And from anybody to look at the project and see what we were doing, it was kind of crazy. Um, we were running streams through the front yard and walkways and bridges and massive trees. These are 25,000 pound trees we're putting in the ground and all kinds of stuff. So I get to walk uh, Charlie, Charlie Bowie, Justin's father, uh, on the job site one Saturday, and I don't know if he said ten words, but the words I remember were, "Well, we look forward to we we look forward to seeing how this comes out." <laughs> All the pressure on me. Never said <laughs> I like what you're doing. What a bang up job. Good job. None of that. It was just, or after I would finish explaining something to him, I might get an, okay. Nice. You know, just re and like, wow. So I knew that everything was on the line there and we had to knock it out of the park. Uh, and we did. We actually knocked the project out of the park. It was super successful, so successful. They bought like another 80 acres next door to develop again. And we got to play in that one as well. What community um, was that? Uh, Saguaro Highlands. Saguaro Highlands. Saguaro Highlands. Nice. And this goes way back. I don't remember all the communities we do, but th that, that day, I remember. Um, so I, I walked uh, Mr. Bob Flaherty, a great mentor to me, your father, a great mentor. Um, you know, they're, they're working for a company that was the, the Toll Brothers was the sixth most well-run company in the world, uh, next to Apple, Google, Amazon, Nordstrom, and Amazon. Toll Brothers is number six. These are multi-billion dollar publicly traded companies and and very, very well run. They execute on everything. So failure is not an option option with these guys. Um, they perform at a very high level. I don't know why Justin was the ra raised the way he was, but <laughs> maybe explains a few things to you. Yeah. Um, so I'm assuming you guys must have, you know, hit it off and then later down the road met Justin. So um, my dad, let me just say this. My dad, you know, Mike, you know my dad. My dad is very, you know, he could be sharp for sure. And there was very few people that my dad respected. Like, not not that he disrespected anybody, but anybody that he would go out of his way to say that I really respect this guy. And Dan was like his dude. Like, I remember when my dad when uh, my dad moved to Colorado, he, he went with Toll Brothers Colorado. When he came back, he was like, he wanted to have lunch with Dan. Like, that was the only person he asked. Like, hey, let's have lunch. And I remember we had lunch at uh, Tempe Marketplace when he came back. But yeah, my dad loved Dan. They got along famously. I think he would have done anything for Dan, and Dan would have done anything for him. Yeah, his dad, uh, he was intimidating to, to all people. I, I would uh, do a presentation in a conference room, and uh, there'd be six, eight people in a conference room, and we're having fun, talking about the project, laughing, joking. His dad walk in the room, boom, room silent. <laughs> and everybody sits up in their chair, and you know he, he commanded a room, but with, with respect and, and great leadership, uh, just uh, when I say respect, a uh, lot of respect. He gave it. And uh, he got it. So uh, really, really great man. Yeah. But the first time I actually met Dan, I had, uh, Dan had designed, or I think you were working side by side with, I think at that time you yeah. were doing pools. I, I designed it and they built it. Okay. So I was plumbing my father's pool and then Dan showed up to the job when I was in the bottom of the pool plumbing. That was the first time I met Dan. Okay. Was that a different house? That's the, no, the house that you've been to on Patrick Lane. Okay. Yeah. Yep. yep, we were out there. Uh, I remember this guy in the hole. You know, he's down the pool plumbing, and he certainly seemed to know a lot more than everybody. And he also he was speaking English. This is you know, this is I don't know maybe oh four or so or five. Uh, the Acura in the driveway. <laughs> but I, I'm I'm F one fifty buddy. <laughs> probably I'm talking with Justin, and it was uh, well this guy knows a lot, and just gave me a lot of confidence because I was still learning. You know. I was doing pool design, but I wasn't building pools. And that transition for us to, to make that decision to say, okay, if we go into the pool business, why would we go in? One, we felt we could do better than what people were, were getting. We felt we could design better than what people were receiving, and we could change the industry. Um, but it, it, it was intimidating, but also the concern of losing all the, the, the business revenue that was coming into our company. Uh, we studied, studied it for a while, um, interviewed all the, the manufacturers and, and contractors and, and made sure we were comfortable with cost, pricing, what we're going to do. And myself or my partner, 
made calls to all the companies we did business with, uh, like Shasta or Paddock or California, whoever it was we were doing business with at the time, and let them know, we're letting you know we're going to the pool business. And respectfully, if you choose to keep doing business with us, uh, we'd love it. If you choose not to, we understand as well. And most of them quickly, man, that shut off. But uh, this was kind of recession time, so it wasn't hitting us that bad. And we went aggressively after uh, pool business opportunity that we felt we could we could do very well at, and and it grew and grew and grew. Uh, we've never it's never been about you know how big we could be. I just wanted to do it well. Um, I enjoy design. I want to do great design. I want to build projects well. Uh, it's it's shoot the first pool we built. I think we were at Shell in seven days, and we were used to like six or eight weeks to get to Shell from most of the pool companies. So we thought we screwed up. Like, what did we miss? Let's go back through it. We forgot it. the steel. Uh, and we just, you know, going back through it. But we found we could start to move really quick in, in the production. As long as we had the permit, we could go and, and we, could, we could move through the projects very fast. Uh, so it actually made it more fun that we could control that process much easier. We didn't have the issues that we would have before where who had accounted for the electrical, who had accounted for a gas run, a water run, you know, whatever it was uh, prior to uh, going to the pool business. Now we were responsible for everything. We could control everything. And uh, if you've ever been in the pool business, sometimes there, there's that dirty word back charges that if you're a contractor, you've received a back charge and, and it, it sucks. Uh, we stopped the back charges because we were accountable to everything. Now, not that we always captured it, but we were accountable to it and we knew what we had to do. So it made our business uh, flow easier, faster. Uh, it was, I think it simplified the process for the homeowners because having the pool contractor argue with the landscape contractor, with the guy who's doing the roof or whatever, we could do all things exterior. And it made, uh, we have one, one gentleman, a lot of respect for, he used the term one neck to choke. So that homeowner or that builder, they can go to one person and you're responsible for everything. And they don't have to manage six different contractor trades outside arguing over different aspects of the project. They have one neck to choke and it just makes it easier. And you're seeing that, that model um, more and more with almost every company since we went into it started to, so all the pool companies went after landscape companies. Most of them do some aspect of it now or have tried. We were able to do it pretty well before we went to the pool, pool side, and I found the pool side to be um, just an easy add-on to you know the, the, the design business that we do. And for me, landscape design, landscape architecture is all things outdoors. It's not just you know pools, it's not just plants, trees, you know, decking, patios, spas, gazebos, barbecues, whatever. It's all things outdoors. And you know that's that's the business that we're in, which happens to encompass you know pools, which are a big part of it. I want to go back a little bit. Do you still think it was a good idea to contact all the builders? I mean, they might not have respected you then, but do you think long term that was a, a good play by you all? Yeah, you know, I, I like I said, uh, you want to trust the people that you know and that you do business with. I, I think it would be a disservice to them because they had they had given us. The opportunity to work with them for many years and to find out later that we were doing pools and they hear from somebody else in the industry that we're doing that I think that would be pretty underhanded um, I, th I felt it was the right thing to do to you know come right out and be very clear this is what we're doing before we start our first dig anything and let them know with respect you know I think that's 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 really important so I'd be pissed if one of my people, you know, I find out later he's doing, you know, he's designing and selling projects on the side and he's building them. And sometimes they're taking your own lead, my leads to do it. That's no good. And so we want to make sure that we're above board on that. So I, I want to, you know, I'll, I'll tell you that actually later, uh, you know, the Giz family, um, they actually encouraged us in, in growth. Um, Buzz Giz, um, David Giz. Actually, I ended up doing uh, a lot of business with David. I did a lot of business with Buzz over the years. I did Buzz's home, David's home, Edward's home. Um, I did some of the ass, ass homes, the the Smith's homes, uh, Tim Murphy's first home, you know, all those guys. Um, the uh, um, 
but the uh, the Gizzes encouraged us and, and actually helped us grow. And they gave us some some different uh, uh, pointers as we they and then they sold. But as they advanced with Paramount, um, they they actually were were pretty helpful uh, with us. And then later, uh, uh, David Giz opened up a a store in North Scottsdale, uh, just doing dedicated to the Jacuzzi brand and above ground spas. And so I, I partnered with him on some some deals there, and we worked with him for uh, quite a few years on that. So it actually turned out to be a good thing. Very you good. Know, I guess yeah. Yeah, integrity is important. For sure. I want to talk a little bit about the everything that you do, because I think, you know, obviously we've talked about landscaping and pools, but one thing, you know, I've been working for creative since you guys started doing pools and I've seen how things have changed. And one thing I think is different and interesting with your company is you guys do so much. You have a full metal fab shop, Love you know, that. Love which, that. which this is my assumption, but you tell me, was that just a function of you need to incorporate these metal elements and you didn't have somebody to go to? Is that what started that? Yeah. So what's it, what, what you're saying there is interesting because I remember if you go back in like, Oh, four, five, six, the design style was Tuscan. Tuscan was everything. Everybody wanted to do Tuscan. Every home in town, everybody puts some, slap some stone on it and call it Tuscan, right? Some were really good Tuscan, you know, the silver leaf stuff. But, you know, a lot of stu stuff, they just, they, they glued stone on the house and they called it Tuscan. But Tuscan also incorporated a lot of uh, uh, wood and wood and pergolas and heavy beams and things like that. Well, we we're doing a lot of that. And watching what wood does in our desert, its life is short. And it's really not the best for the desert. And thinking a lot about steel, um, something that would be more durable to you know our environment, I started thinking about it. Well, as I started talking with steel guys, it it seemed like such a challenge to get these steel guys to understand the concepts that we were doing. And some of the concepts we were doing were maybe out there a little bit too far, but I felt it was possible. And frustrated enough that I hired my first welder and bought the first equipment and started to play with the first projects that we did. And then you know hired a second welder. And I'm thinking in my mind, I'm gonna learn about steel in about a year. It's gonna take me a year to figure out steel. This is really simple. If I've got a good engineer, structural engineer, we can figure anything out. And, and, and you really can, but it takes time. Um, but what see, types of things are you making with that? Anything, anything. There's, there, we don't really have a certain specific item that we make, but everything that we want to make, we can make out of metal. Um, and we use aluminum, uh, 304, steel, 304, stainless, 316 stainless, um, all different you know, products. It just depends on what we're building and what material we're going to use for it. Um, and different types of powder coating, um, sera coating, um, you know, different types of finishes that go on it. Uh, I was going to say, I've seen a lot of stuff, especially your stuff that has like a patina on it. Mm -hmm. Do you add that stuff yep. at the shop? We, even even you know, patina, it, um, uh, you know, the sera coat for like, if you if you are a weapons guy, uh, you want want to buy your wife a Tiffany blue firearm, you can have it sera coated for high heat. So we use sera coating on like our fire features and things like that. So it doesn't, uh, you know, melt down in the... What's the difference between sera coat and powder coat? Powder coat um, might last, I don't know, a couple hundred degrees. Mm -hmm. um, sera coat can go to like 5,000 degrees. Oh. So you can, you can burn. So like uh, propane and natural gas burn around 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so a higher heat tolerance you, you really need, where most of your paint finishes might be a couple hundred degrees. So they'll mm. come off. And you can, you can buy inexpensive high heat paints, but they might be like 800 or 1,000 degrees. And again, if you're burning gas right there, um, or wood, whatever it is, but you can get up to you know, really, really high heat. So you need a, the, the right product to finish it. So every, everything that's high heat related, you know, that, that's what we do. Um, so you're making like uh, custom fire pits and different things like that. We can do yeah you know, from fire pits to uh, structures, awnings. Um, it may just be the support that's up inside a structure you actually don't see, but how you can carry weight. Like I walked in the office here and just seeing ah uh, how they carried that much weight through steel, not wood. Um, it, it just has. It, there's so many great properties to it, um, but it's it's endless. It's infinite what you can do with you know all these materials. Um, How many welders are you running at now? We've got about 20 welders. I was going to say, I see their trucks up Damn. at the Phoenician, like yeah. three and four deep. Yeah, so we, that's, it's interesting you say that. We've, uh, we've got uh, five trucks that are fully loaded. Each truck is about 130,000. 
between truck and equipment, and we just and in fact they're asking me to buy another truck right now. You know, just, you, you watch what the market's doing. Do we need to add another truck to it? But uh, those trucks are fully equipped to do anything on any job site, yeah. um, and making sure that they've got the best equipment. All brand new trucks, all brand new equipment. It's a big investment to to get your ROI from. But we've done it better and better. And I've got a, a gentleman who David who runs that shop, and he's 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 incredible. Um, water jets, water jet. We sub out. Okay. Water jet. Plasma cutting. Yeah, all the water jetting. Um, there's a company that we work with. Uh, they do a lot of government projects mm-hmm. and super super high tolerance. So when you get to somebody who's really good at water jetting, and it happens to be a guy that I knew from, believe it or not. I, I grew up next door to him, like when I was a little kid, like five years old. So hmm. I didn't know we were using this company. Somebody said, "Let's try this company." We're using them. Next thing you know, I find out, gosh, that's a guy I grew up next door to when I was a little kid. Small world. He taught me how to ride a bicycle. These are the days of like evil can evil, and taught me how to ride a bicycle, and you know, put a helmet on me and push me across the lawn and watch me wreck and <laughs> whatever. But so he he's done. Uh, all of our water jetting, and they're very precise. Uh, they do it very well, um, super sharp. And he's one of those guys that uh, he's been in. He's kind of a gearhead guy who's been doing it for his entire life. So when you come with a little bit of a challenge, he likes it and can solve it. Awesome. And like I said, where we got into the business was uh, with the, all the all things metal. Um, a lot of guys couldn't think beyond the basic things that most people do. It was too complex for them. And so a lot of the guys that we have, um, um, they're, they're just a, kind of a, a rough band of welders, but they get to do all things welding. So they don't sit on a line and, and crank the same thing out day after day. Every day is a new project. We set a 25,000 pound roof. They built this roof on a lot next door. Yeah, they finished it Monday of this week and a 90 ton crane came in the back picked it up, set it up, set it on there uh, yesterday morning. Uh, but it's got all kinds of uh, holes cut out through the ceiling with uh, water jetted panels that will drop in and just all kinds of fun stuff. That'll be a, a pretty cool one that'll come out. Do you remember that <clears throat> you remember that model pool? I think it was at Monta Vista that had the over the spot, had the circle and the oh, circle. Oh, yes. Yeah. I, that was, was that steel? Was that built out of steel? That was steel. It, it, sh- it, it should not have been steel. Um, I did actually... I redesigned that. They actually sold the home to a new owner, and I worked with a new owner, and I actually redesigned it. Everything exactly the same, but... Um, Did I, it deteriorate or what? Yeah, it, oh. too much de- deterioration on it. But uh, uh, that, I only did that one one time. That still is always like in the back of Dude, my mind, one of my favorites. So that was sweet. super cool. It, imagine like a round spa, and it had this cantilever steel ring. Like a reverse vortex that came inside... It yeah. was wild. And it would fill up and overflow into the spa. So it was like this ring that was raining down, like a ring of water. Dude, it was so sick. Where is that at? That's in Monta Vista, which is up in North Scottsdale. And the yeah. pool the pool next to it, I remember Toll Brothers made you cut it in half when it was almost done. It's a good story. Yeah. that They thought the pool the pool was like shot created everything. And Toll Brothers, it was a model. They came out and they said, hey, you know what? It takes up too much space. They had to cut it in half. Hold on. Hold on. So... That spa is, is an inspiration for one I'm, I'm looking to do. It's in my head. I haven't designed it yet, but I'm going to design it in the next couple of weeks. That one, it's the only time I've ever done. I, I hate to repeat my design. If I don't have to repeat it, I'm happy. Um, sometimes you take components of it, you continue to repeat those things. But the exact design, I don't, I don't like to repeat. But that one was always like, that was one of my, my oh, favorites. Sweet. It was well done. Um, the pool next door, I got a call from the uh, 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 division vice president, and he's in California. He says, ah, I'm thinking about that project. That pool, it's way too big. We got to do something different. My boss is going to come out and he's going to look at it. And it was on a Friday. I think over the weekend, he said, We're walking it Wednesday morning. We got to cut it in half and <laughs> redo the whole pool. I said, You have a good weekend. I'll make it happen. And he walked out there Wednesday morning. We had it all set up, ready to go. And they walked out like nothing happened. But we cut it. <laughs> We cut probably 30 feet off a pool or something. It was the Baja end, too. There was so much freaking shit in it. But even better, so that was a model home, and they thought the pool was too big. They end up selling the home to a guy who ended up taking the pool back to what we originally designed. You guys redid it. I don't know Uh, if you remember that. I don't remember that. 
But it, we actually took the pool back to the original design, not even knowing the homeowner, just, he bought the home. He's like, you know what I'd like to do? Make it bigger. <laughs> I'd like to extend it. And he took it back to what we originally did. That sucks. So, yeah, that was wild. Shit. Yeah. I want to I wanna go back real quick. Um, what kind of things did you have to think about business-wise before uh, starting the fab shop? I know you were having issues, and it was like, dude, it'd just be so much easier if I had my own crew where – there's some things that you were talking with your partner or with your team where it's like, if this is going to make sense, because it's not cheap to, to get that right. started. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure people listening to this be like, fuck, yeah, I want a fab shop. Like, what are some things that you thought about or you should think about before doing that? You need a lot of space, a lot of space, a lot of land. Uh, I, ju I just bought two and a half acres and I'm going into the city now with plans. I, I think I'm on my second red line with the city so I can build bigger shop more land, more space. Steel takes up a lot of a lot of room, um, it, and it's big. It's heavy. You lift it with forklifts. It's there's a there's a lot of money that goes goes behind it. How does it get delivered? Like uh, semis and forklifts. Okay. Yeah, so they need enough room to. Yeah, just semis have to be able to pull in my yard and and you know move around and stuff like that. It's uh, it, you know, and you know, the more you buy, the better. If you're buying small increments, it's expensive. So we actually buy in, in large quantities, or we'll, I'll buy out like six months so that I can I can keep cost in check. But you know you're writing you know, six figure checks just to keep cost of that down. Um, otherwise, you're going to pay you know instead of a hundred grand, that same product could be uh, five hundred grand. So to keep cost down, you can actually buy in volume. It's it's just a different commodity. Yeah. It's I don't know. It's it's. Uh, it's been 17 years. We've been doing steel work, aluminum work, metal, stainless, all that stuff. Uh, it's gotten better and better. Uh, processes that we have developed through trial and error. Uh, but it, it is a cool thing. We anything we design. It's uh, there was a, there was a, a I was on that job site. We're we're setting that roof yesterday, and we had to reach out because we're building these. Um, if you've ever been to a high-end resort, you know where they they rent you the cabana for I don't know thousand, fifteen hundred bucks, and they might give you a bottle service, whatever. Um, when you're out by the pool, but that cabana is fifteen hundred bucks. You know you can build a cabana for five, six, seven grand, roughly, without furniture. And but you think about these hotels renting for you know three, four days, a week at that kind of price point. Paid in, in two weeks, they pay for themselves, oh. um, and then the rest is just profit, pure profit. Um, but we, we had done a couple of those cabanas, and um, they, they looked really good outside. It's just a really cool cool thing, especially to have in your backyard. And this project had a couple. Um, the I forget where I was going, going with that. Um, oh, we had talked to the fabric people that were going to create all the fabric around the cabanas. And they said, you know what? The best way we can make, make sure this adheres and it stays looking really good and tight we need this detail all the way around. Boom. Um, that was yesterday morning. I've got plans uh, catted on my desk this morning, ready to go. They're in the shop. Um, they'll start on those Friday, and they'll be done by like Tuesday next week. I can move things very quickly that way. Um, so it's just, it's nice. If I'm calling somebody else who is a um, fabricator and hoping they understand what I'm looking to do. Sometimes there's just a lot of lead time. Okay, I'll get you a price and how much it costs. And um, shoot, I might have the scrap in my yard too. So um, we can actually pull from the scrap and, and build things. So, do you also have like an in house cut and sew team that does stuff for? No, a lot of that stuff we'd have cut really quick before it even shows up to to the yard. Okay. Um, and it's 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 quite inexpensive instead of the, you know, the ROI on the equipment that you'll buy. Um, you can actually have a cut cut out there pretty quick. Um, even special bending and stuff like that um, can be done pretty quickly. So, what else do you guys do? So, you got, I guess, just so people can understand. So, you got design, huge design team, huge sales team. I'm assuming. Did the designer sell, or is that the the, the designer? So, here here's my world. Um, you know, if if I design something and it's really good, and and you're you're thinking on the level of you know something that you want to build in your backyard it, you want you want a next level project in your backyard and you consult with a really good designer and you guys collaborate together and our team looks at here's what the cost is to build it and when that's presented to you and they contract 
when they contract, it's a sale. But my person's role is a designer. In other companies, they're salesmen. Mm. They, they really, they're, they're salesmen. Our team, they're designers, and they've got to be designers. Um, if, if I've got to sell people, maybe I don't have the right product. But if my design's really good, man, I want that. Do you guys, <clears throat> if a customer comes to you, because that's a huge investment, I see you're doing crazy 3 Ds and all this other stuff, do they have to pay for the design up front? Like if they don't use you, do, they, do you charge a design fee? So <clears throat> we have agreements with our big preferred. So we, we a lot of our business comes through um, big preferred relationships um, with big builders and our, our win ratio is very high. Uh, we're bringing that design to the client at no cost. Mm. It's, it's not guaranteed. We have to do the work. We have to be, um, we have to be competitive in cost and we have to deliver everything up front. And if we do that, we end up with a contract and our, our projects like that have a very high win ratio. And so I don't charge for the design only because the relationships who with the people who are bringing me in. Now, if it's somebody that's you know one off, they're building a custom home, uh, they want a quote to um, have a design for their home, whether they're going to use us or not. Yes, there is a, fee, a design fee for that. Okay. Or when we're out of state, uh, designing in different places, those are, there's design fees to those. So uh, it just depends on the relationship who it is. But part of what that um, that let's say it's a big builder who's bringing us in. Part of what they're they're committing to us is we're going to work with you, uh, make sure that we help manage you and the process. You guys deliver the goods to our client, do it at a very high level, and they let the client know this is a company that's coming in, and we're bringing them in at no cost to you up front. If you choose to go with them, great. If you choose not to, that's okay. But there is no cost to you. Um, and our our goal is to you know, you know do it well, and, and hopefully earn that opportunity. So, Dan, we work for a bunch of builders, custom guys, volume guys. You know, we, we can pretty much do it all here with our company. And, and one thing that I get to see, you know, as we work for you, and what, what I think sets different for you or may, makes you different or just a different setup is you're doing crazy, complex, design-heavy projects, but you're not doing 12 a year. You're doing a shit ton a year. Yeah, We get... We get plans from you guys, and it's Lautner, Lautner, Lautner. It's almost to the point for a while now where Lautner is like your basic pool, and right. then everything else is crazy one-off. Can you talk a little bit about how you got there? Because there's a lot of people that maybe they're going to build one or two Lautners in an entire year, and that's a great year for them, and you're just like just having breakfast doing Lautners. I don't Lautners. know. Yeah. I don't know. It's pretty fascinating. It really is. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I don't know how it all, all happens. I, I do and I don't. Because, like like you said, the, the complexities of it, we have people that come in and work with us um, from good companies, great companies, or companies from California that they, they were doing you know high level stuff, uh, but they step into our world and we do it fast. Um, we're we're go. We want to go as fast as possible. I'm gonna erase the last couple of years of of the COVID world of supply chain and all the chaos that we all went went through. It's getting better quickly, fast. Um, pri prior to that, we could move much quicker. Um, <clears throat> but today, it's uh, you know, continue to build people, support people, um, design detail. We have a library that is so vast now of details that we've used, details that have worked, and details that didn't work. And reviewing, I review details almost on the daily. Um, projects are, are coming through, projects that are sold, reviewing the details of how it's supposed to be built, and it's, it's just constant process improvement. You're never, ever done. Probably one thing that I love about the, the business and the, and the industry is we're not building the same pool that some companies are from 1990. They're doing the same thing that they did 30 years ago, 40 years ago, um, and they're never gonna change. Um, the evolution of what we want to do is always bringing something new, something fresh, um, creating trends in design. I think we've done that. There's, there's ways I could, I could show you and point out things that we started out with, and now I can go on. I can see 
you know, that by the hundreds, you know, around the valley, around the nation, people are, are following design trends that I know were original pieces that we did. Um, and people are getting into a lot of the aspects of um, materials that we use as well. Um, and then other people certainly are advancing, which is kind of cool, but people are advancing, you know, far beyond that. But, uh, you know, just, just really driven to, you know, design and build um, with great people, teaching people. I love learning. I think the thing that keeps me like really, really, it's almost like adrenaline to me. Learning to me is kind of adrenaline. Uh, the more I learn about things, the more I learn about uh, whatever properties it is or, um, you know, the physics of the things that, that we get into, um, you know, the, the barriers that you break down, the more you figure out. Uh, it's, it's just fun. And it, it, it kind of opens up this new world of where you can go in design. And it's happening progressively multiplied faster today than it did 10 years ago and 20 years ago, because where we all got design inspiration 20 years ago was you got a magazine that came to your house like Phoenix Home and Garden or um, Architectural Digest would show up once a month and you'd flip through it and there were two or three projects that you were interested in. Now you can pick up your phone and you can see 10,000 yeah. know, in a day. And you couldn't, you didn't have access to that kind of information you know, just 10 years ago. And so there's so much out there that people are studying, they're figuring out quicker. So design is advancing faster than I've ever seen it. Um, it, it makes it difficult for us because people can follow us or will now follow people because there's, there's other, other companies out there that I've seen. You had Rick Chafee on um, recently and I know a, a lot of uh, admiration for him. I think he's a, he's a, he's a great builder. Um, but there's a lot of companies out there right now that are doing some really, really cool things and starting to take design to the next level. Um, how we do it in the production sense, um, today um, we do probably, we probably have about 600 projects that are contracted, we're working on in different you know, uh, aspects, but maybe 150 that are under construction, actually under construction, probably in the neighborhood about 150. Um, and they're in mostly you know, high level. Uh, we, we get now quite a few million dollar plus projects that are that are underway. You're seeing those numbers go up. The the six hundred, seven, eight hundred thousand. There's a lot of those. Then the million and million plus that are going on, and that's residential. And then you got the commercial stuff that gets even bigger. The uh, I don't know. We've 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 figured something out. We've uh, do you think we've it done well? Do you think it has to do with your relationship with the builders? Because one thing I notice is even on projects that you're not building is people reference back to those models at white wing or those models at Azure or whatever. Do you think, how much do you think that played into it? Cause you guys build, you guys go all out on the models. Yeah. And then now somebody can physically look at it, which I mean, I know some other production <clears throat> builders like, you know, Shasta and those guys, they aren't putting lot in their edges in on models. No. In fact, that's, that, that was a, 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 an opportunity for us on this project in particular next door Shasta did the pool. And we did this one, and and and, and all respect to Shasta because they've been here for a long time. And they, they, uh, you know, Skip Senior did some great things with that company, but uh, they didn't want to build. I actually did the design and detail for them on the pool next door. So I built this pool. It's my very first one with Shea Homes, and they built the one next door. Theirs was a rectangle, right? Yeah, it was a rectangle, but they struggled. They had issues. Uh, the VP of construction called me out to consult with them. And so we talked about you know, a way to solve the problem. They didn't want to do it, and it, it was a mistake, in my opinion only. That's just my opinion. You know, this is this is probably opinionated more so. Uh, but you know, since then we've taken over a lot of a lot of that business um, and continue to just try to advance it. Again, I just want to get better. Everything I do, I want to get better. I'm never never settled with. As soon as I see these like this one, I can critique. It's a it was a, a national award winning gold medal project, um, but I could critique the hell of it. I could always do this one better. Next time I'll do it better. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite quotes is uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. And they asked him, of all the projects that you've done in your lifetime, and you know, not too many people have a, a style of architecture that's after their name. You know, it's Tuscan, it's Mediterranean, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, 
Adobe. It's um, there's all kinds of different you know types modern. of modern. But how many have a, a name like it's Frank Lloyd Wright inspired? And so he did some pretty amazing things in architecture. And the probably most memorable quote that I've heard from him was when asked which was his favorite project was his next one. Mm -hmm. And that's that's for me. You know, I can't wait to do the next one. It's got to get better. It can get it just infinitely better, you know? What do you beat yourself up on the most? Is it like... <clears throat> <clears throat> Mistakes that I've made before that I shouldn't make again that we didn't properly document the process and make sure it went through the company properly because we made it again and we know better why did it happen how do we stop that from being repeated that's probably the biggest one that's most costly um let's say what are you guys doing different today than you were you know five ten years ago in terms of uh when a job gets completed are you walking is there somebody walking through and kind of you know going through a checklist making sure everything is this, dialed in i'll tell you this is uh i'm gonna tell you so you you mentioned something this this goes into attracting talent so i i, I was exposed to a uh, a process you know probably 12 13 14 15 years ago and this this process talks we're gonna get a little, little bit deep here but the, the process talks about um it's it's kind of profiling people and you know seven plus billion people in the world and when you start looking at uh how many people in the world and how people think and process what i never understood was every single person at that number seven billion thinks and processes and feels and reacts differently. My wife, my son, my parents, Justin, Greg, everybody in the room, every one of us is going to think and process of how things should be done differently. Or when you're driving, you're with your wife, and you're just, oh, stop the car. You know, what, are you, what are you reacting to? I don't process that way. She processes that way, I don't process that way. Um, understanding that to kind of a different level. And, you know, historically hiring people, you get a resume that's well written by the individual who is writing a story about their work history. And they're writing a pretty good story typically about how good they are. And you meet them and they're on their best behavior. And you, you know, believe a lot of what they tell you and you vet them the best you can. And when they come on board, you quickly find out how they process things, what they're really all about, um, you know, how they perform at their job. And you know, everybody has different levels of, of performance, right? Um, but what's, what's even more interesting, so there, there's uh, uh, a gentleman who became a, a great mentor to me, his name is Webb Edwards, his wife Kathy, great people. They, uh, just as a gift to my wife and I, they flew this guy out from Texas. My wife and I take this test. And this test kind of profiles how I think and who I am in, in a lot of different levels. And the same thing for my wife, how she thinks and who she is. And what was very clear is both of us process everything in life differently, very differently. And in my world, I'm normal. In Justin's world, how Justin thinks, everything he does, he's totally normal. Anybody else that doesn't do what Justin does, they're, they're messed up, right? Um, and at the end of this, like several hour dinner, and we're talking with these people and, and just uh, a lot of fun. But at the end, I'm, I'm saying, so when you've, you've done how many of these tests, and he's done, you know, like 100,000 tests, they did everything for Wells Fargo. And uh, of all these tests that you've done, what's the most normal? I'm thinking he's going to say kind of you, Dan, you're the most normal. And he just looked at me and he said, you don't, you don't really get it, do you? There, there is no normal. Everybody is different. Only thing is normal is how you process and think and, and you know, deliver and feel. Um, that was really interesting. So it allowed my wife and I actually to, as, you know, and my wife lifts me up. I'm, I'm here partially because of all the good things that, you know, I've got a good woman. She, she supports me and everything I want to do, believes in me. Uh, but the way she processes is different. 
and for me to give her space to think and process the way she needs to is actually healthy for a relationship. If I'm always telling her what she needs to do and how, what she needs to say and how she needs to react, um, it's, it's stress on our marriage, right? So allowing her as much space as I can is actually better for our marriage. Fast forward that to the question of um, attracting talent and being able to um, create teams that do things very well. So when you wanna build a really good team, the deeper you know the profile of that person in a healthy way, you can find better, stronger people to build a company. And if you said, I want somebody, this individual that is specifically this, and this is how they think, and this is the detail that they like to go into, um, this is the follow-up, this is the communication, I want all these aspects of an individual, and you could find that person to put in your company with a very high success rate, you're gonna be more successful. And I started out with this just over a year and a half ago, and it was a lot of work to um, start to create profiles of people and do the study and do the work. Uh, but since then, and, and I, I actually got discouraged because I wanted, I was hiring faster. I needed to hire like 40, 50 people. This is like 21 and 22. I needed 40, 50 people like now, really fast. And I couldn't get them quick enough. And so I was just hiring and anybody that was coming through the door, but I wasn't, I wasn't hiring the right people to fit the role that I was looking for. And there's a gentleman named Mike Wargo with Job Force that I connected up with. And he got me to settle down, because I like to go fast, um, got me to settle down and adjusted his program to work with me. And since then, we've created uh, you know, the profiles of the individuals. Um, when we go to hire an individual, they go through this um, assessment, and this assessment tells me how well they fit that profile. And I'm looking for nines and tens, tens the highest, nines and tens. If I find tens, almost guaranteed they're hired. Um, even if I don't even need the position, I'll almost hire them because they're that hard to find. And so we have been hiring at uh, an amazing rate with a very high success rate that has certainly changed our operations to be far more successful and allow us to grow in a much healthier way. Because when you don't have the right people in position and you're trying to get through volume, um, it's very, very difficult to do. So, you know, we've, uh, we've found a really good rhythm in doing this and in bringing on really great people assets um, to execute on the positions that we want. It's been absolutely amazing. It has completely changed our, our company. Um, our profitability has gone much higher. Our efficiencies have gone better. Jobs are going much smoother. Uh, that's been a huge, huge game changer that I've never experienced in all, all my all my business career. Um, absolutely best thing I've done. That's great. That's yeah, awesome. Super cool. It's 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 so I, I don't think most people would believe it or understand it or have the patience for it. And and, and again I go back to the story of this gentleman who was uh, he was uh, president of a company called Norwest Bank. Norwest Bank came and bought a small bank called Wells Fargo he became an executive vice president for Wells Fargo. And I said, well, wait a minute, you guys were so big, Norwest Bank, why did you become Wells Fargo? He said, had you ever heard of Norwest Bank? I said, no. Well, we bought the brand Wells Fargo and they became Wells Fargo. But they used this from senior leadership top down through the company. And he went into detail um, a couple times and shared with me the, the success that they had through doing this. He retired back in 06. Uh, but he's always been a mentor to me. Um, in fact, we just finished another project up at his house. Every year he's got a, uh, he, he gets a bug and he's like, I wanna mm -hmm. do something, come on up here. Let's let's go look at what we can do. And so um, he's got a, always got a project somewhere, but he's also been a um, probably one of my top five mentors um, that's helped me grow in business. So the business side is it's really important. You gotta have good people. So who all takes this test? Because I can't help but think that you know, there are a lot of, you know, uh, laborers, craftsmen, plumbers, people in the trenches, people that are really good with their hands and they're very smart. They're just not, uh, they're just not as articulate when it comes to like reading a question on a form and responding to <clears throat> it, uh, you know, the way that maybe it, it I got to assume that, th that there's got to be, it's got to be difficult for certain trades, right? It's not. No? It's not. You can use it for every single position in the company. It's so, 
initially, and, and my thinking is, is the same as yours, Greg, the, the, uh, the thought to find a guy that would fill the role, and we were hiring outside of that, but there were specific positions that we were trying to hire for that we were struggling with, and we were hi highly focused on those. And, and again, I was, I was hopeful, I was optimistic, but really didn't quite know what was gonna happen. And now as I see the results, the results are, you, you can't argue with it. It's, it's, it's so powerful. It's made my life so much better. It's made the business so much better. It's made the culture in our company so much better. Um, and, and watching these people, they're growing the company. It's like the company's growing on its own. It's, it's crazy and we're growing. We'll have our biggest year this year and it's, it's going into a down year. So most companies are going down, we're growing. So we're gonna have absolutely incredible year. We're gonna, we'll, we'll smash it this year over any year we've ever had in business. That's great. It's crazy. It, and, and you just gotta, you gotta, you gotta work it. it. It takes that extra effort. I actually went in Saturday. I didn't wanna do it, but I had to create three more assessments for new positions. And I really didn't wanna go to work Saturday, but it was that important. So I went in Saturday, took time, shut things out. Um, got that work done and made sure it was there so we can we can keep going because if I don't you know we risk um, you know the cost of hiring somebody you think let, let's say somebody's um, I don't know a hundred grand a year easy, easy number but after you, you they're in a truck there's fuel there's there's uh, you know, insurance FICA food assurance, insurance is it you're, you're, you're 10 grand a month for an individual and they're on training for first month not second month and you've got people dedicated to them to transition training, which costs you money as well. So 10 grand a month, plus, plus, plus. You know, 90 days in, all of a sudden, you're, you're whatever, you have 40,000 into a position. And if it's not working, you know, it's, it's, it's easier to um, find the right person. So Very find good. the right people, really, really important. So Dan, with all the uncertainty in the market and everybody's talking about what this year is gonna do, what, uh, what are you doing to prepare and, and uh, what does that look like in your plan? <clears throat> well, it's 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 been a wild ride, Justin, to say the least. Coming <laughs> out of uh, twenty twenty one into twenty two, we saw the slowdown uh, probably April May of twenty two, um, based on all the things we were seeing with the housing market already softening. The industrial market's good, but um, we don't play in as much, and there's not as much money there. Uh, but we started to see it happen, and the feedback we were certainly aware. trying to keep a client happy when you can't tell them that the shipping container sitting in Long Beach is gonna be sitting there for two more months and you don't know when it's gonna be unloaded, um, when that product's going to get to you. Uh, there's so many uncertainties. So last couple of years are super, super difficult for um, us in client management and we have a lot of clients and nobody was happy. It was, it was a worse buying experience I think for everybody over the last couple of years. If you wanna go find a truck, good luck. If you want to go find a new car, good luck. A house, good luck. Appliances, good luck. Um, just really, really tough for everybody. And certainly if you're hiring a contractor and we're all tapped in business and resources weren't available, it was a, it was a bad experience. I know that. And it's, 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 uh, it's been hard for me last couple of years. Uh, but right now, my focus has been on where the market is going. And the market certainly has taken a downturn. Um, looking at what do we do to sustain through a market like this. I went through 08, 08 was a tough market. Uh, this, this market was just smashed. We were at some of the highest highs in, in the US and we had some of the lowest lows. And who knows, we could experience the same thing. So preparing for that to me means a really hyper focus on the client experience, and we're just getting back to where we can start to deliver that at a, at a better pace. We went from six months ago, your shot creep was out six months. So when you were green tagged on your steel, you were up to six months waiting for shot creep. And telling a client that they don't care, they don't want to hear that Taiwan Semiconductor took all your concrete, Intel took it, whatever it happened. Um, we're getting that stuff faster. We solved a lot of those problems. So. The focus on managing the client experience right now is we've hired people in-house. We're still hiring. Um, 
you know, we're going into a downside, but we're still hiring. We're hiring people to communicate more with the client. We're demanding more of our design team to communicate more with the client. We're asking for all of our schedules to be updated twice a week. So if there's changes in the schedule, don't start out with the, the schedule at the beginning of a three month project. And then while it changed and you missed your date by a month and not talking about the change orders and, and the changes that happened, rain delays, whatever it was, um, continue to update that client on what's happening and why and much stronger communication. We've invested inside our office um, to a lot more uh, people within our office of which we refer to as project engineers, um, our purchasing team, our construction management team, our area managers. We've got a whole staff dedicated to focus on the project along with the rest of the company dedicated to much higher level of communication. And, and I'm saying that right now, it's interesting because I don't think I would want to talk about it six months ago because it was pretty rough. Uh, but today, I see where we're going. We've been able to deliver on projects uh, much better. We're reaching out and touching base with our clients differently than we did before. Our schedules are staying on track. I, I think if you're, you're a, a client of a home builder or a homeowner and somebody sets expectations with you and you're in agreement with those expectations and you can meet or beat those expectations at a high quality, you're going to be a happy client. And I think that's, that's what's most important. Prior to this, we were missing communication. We were missing delivery on time. There are things that we were doing. I, I would say that um, it, it was embarrassing. It was very difficult, but there was a lot of things that were beyond our control. And knowing where we had to get to, we're getting there in a much healthier sense. How does that um, change where we're at as the economy starts to go down? I expect to get more business opportunity because we're performing. I expect to get uh, more referrals because we're performing. Um, I expect to campaign. I had a marketing meeting yesterday. We'll campaign off those happy clients that we're having today. Because if you look back last couple of years, everybody had a crappy experience. But we will campaign off of that um, to spread the good word because, you know, bad news travels really fast. Good news doesn't travel very quickly, but starting to campaign off that um, is, is really important for us. And really, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, I had a uh, very large vendor, you know, it, it's, it's all been in the back of my head. But one thing that hit me um, a couple months ago, I had a very large vendor who came in and they heard we were shifting part of our business. Uh, they said, gosh, you guys, you know, half a million dollars worth of your business. I know you guys bought it, but you didn't buy it from us. Why? And I said, you couldn't deliver it to me. You guys couldn't get it to me. And in fact, my credit line is this. And but you'd sh I was buying so much, you'd say, oh, we're, we're going to shut you down. I'd send you a check the same day, whatever, so we could open back up to buy. But you would miss that small window of the, the volume of purchasing I was doing. So I went to these guys who I had zero credit line with just by my word. Um, they held product for me to make sure I could get it. And the customer service that they delivered to me was better than what you guys have done for the last, I don't know, um, you know, 15, 16 years. So yes, I'm moving business that direction. But they were sitting in my office because they were concerned about losing the business. <laughs> They were sitting in my office because they were they were concerned about losing the business. They got it backwards. They should have been sitting in my office and we us talking together as a team of how we grow the business. And and I realized at that point that's something that I need to get back out and continue to say thank you to the people who supported me, um, the people who have um, helped our company get in the position it is today. And so and since then, actually that that day. I went and named all my top, you know, uh, clients, and there was there was a, a quite a number of them, and big clients that, that bring in big business, um, and went through and we found gift baskets for every single one of them, and we delivered them on Valentine's Day, just to say how much I love you. <laughs> you know, that's that's important. I I still have your business. I need to say thank you. I will do anything for you. I love you guys. I appreciate it. Um, this week, we're delivering Irish car bombs to all these same guys. Just uh, St. Patty's Day is coming up um, to match with Greg's green shirt here. Uh -huh. um, but um, I got to say thank you more, and I wasn't doing that. And so to get back to our, our, our clients, our builders, 
um, it's really important to go go ahead and, and you know, say I'm wrong when you're wrong, apologize and and move forward, but also say thank you enough that they know that um, I really value their business, I really appreciate their business, uh, that's, that's really important, and that will grow your business. Uh, it always has, but uh, we certainly missed it. You know, COVID screwed things up. It was, everybody was Zoom, you don't go see people, you're not shaking hands, there's no face-to-face, -face. all that stuff disappeared, and that's gone. You know, it's time to get back to doing what we did well before, and, and being humans, talking to each other, um, sharing stories, you know, like we're doing today. Um, it's just, it's, you know, be good people. Be good people. You need to step up our game again, too. I'm going to say that is so powerful. But like you said, I mean, that um, customer, what do you call that? When you're keeping, uh, shit, Perception. have the word to, no, damn, there's a word for it. But it's when you're staying on top of your client like, management. Yeah. Um, Reputation management. Yeah, that's what I was looking that, for. That's a, that's a big one. That's a big one. Uh -huh. Because that's what you're doing. I mean, if we're going through two, three years of people's reputation just going down the toilet, the biggest builders in the country going down the toilet, but you can take that opportunity to up your marketing and switch the campaign to no matter what happens, we're, we're going to counter it with we're going to do the right thing, right or wrong. We're going to communicate with you and keep it going. But reputation management, that's, yeah. that's it. It's a, it's it's you have to stay on top of it. And that comes back to, you know, you got to trust the people you do business with. Yeah. And and it's not just the gifts, but it's being there. Um, I had a, a big builder who just finished a uh, phase two of his project. And phase two finished last Friday. I think it was last Friday. Friday. Yeah, last Friday. It finished of his project. And this next phase is over a billion dollars in building. And we just finished the, the beginning of phase two that will take him, it should generate another billion in revenue for the company. Um, I made sure I was there almost every single day and spent time on site to make sure every detail was followed up on, every detail was taken care of, um, anything that was asked was, was done. We had to perform at the highest level. We worked seven days a week from almost January until February, I don't know, end of February, um, a little bit into March, but we went almost two months straight, seven days a week, um, long days, whatever it takes, we have to deliver. He expects it, they had a grand opening, everything has to happen. Our commitment to them, we need to prove it by actions. And and it was hard for everybody, um, costly, because a lot of overtime that's not you know figured into the projects, but at the end of the day, um, look at the the revenue that we could earn off the coming business is preparing for that downturn and we want to dominate on that we want to capitalize on that as much as possible so you know you, you go hard don't don't be afraid to work hard some people don't want to do it and hope that it happens but you know do the things that most most others won't that's powerful you could drop the mic now <laughs> Sorry, were you going to say something, Justin? I was just going to reflect on that time we took donuts and they didn't want them. Me? No, it wasn't, yeah. your, it wasn't your company. I was like, damn, we calling not, them out right now? Not my company. Yeah. Oh, I'm telling you. We used, to, we used to be known for dropping off sprinkles. I do feel, I feel like since COVID, we've totally, like, I look back sometimes and I'm like, I haven't talked to that guy in so long. I haven't seen him in so long. It, you feel alienated. And, and it, it feels awkward, like, hey, haven't seen what's going on. and Feels insincere. Um, but, man, I, I miss, I love, there's, you know, I, I've got reps that come into the company that eh, they don't do a whole lot for you. Uh, but I've got reps that come in and they have content, they deliver, they're uh, critically important. I'm, I'm honored the fact that they walk in the door. Um, these people are, uh, you know, they walk in the door, everybody in the company knows who they are. Um, you know, they're seen in another level. When these, these people walk in the door, um, my, my people love them. And you know, if there's a box of, Donuts, sprinkles, cookies, you know, somebody brought in Einstein's the other day, but you know, they come over and they'll talk to you. And all these people that they're also decision makers in the company, they're gonna talk to you and they're gonna ask questions or you can start to build, you know, a little bit more rapport and rebuild that, uh, 
you know, that separation that we had through COVID. It was a weird separation. I hated it. Hated it. I mean, that, the, I'm talking big billion dollar companies, massive, massive corporate offices, ghost town, nobody in there. What do you do? How, you can't go deliver to everybody's house necessarily. So yeah, that, that was a, a big adjustment. And you know, I'm pushing back because people, somebody the other day, let's just do a Zoom meeting. No, nope, I'm gonna come drive to your, to your office and let's meet face to face. Um, you gotta get more, more of that face to face. So I don't know, I think that's important. So in preparing for a downturn, for me, right talent, right assets, um, really focused on incredible hires that really fit the role that you're looking for, number one, and number two, um, rebuild your brand and reputation. And, and what are you doing? What are you investing into your brand and reputation, which really should go back to your clients? It's what I had uh, coming in here today. Somebody said somebody needed, uh, uh, they were thinking about some stone on a wall, but didn't know if they want to spend the extra money. We didn't perform as well as we should have. I said, give it to them. How much stone is it? I want to know. And how much money we're going to give away, but uh, give it to them. We owe that to them, and and um, don't put profit before um, the you know, the progress that you could make here in this market. Um, always take care of those people. Sometimes it hurts, but you know, play the game long term. For sure, I love it. I love it. You want to jump into the last? Yeah, I do have. We're probably gonna have to have you back again. Ah, I um, would love it. This is this is this is pretty definitely. great. Too. Because, I, I could, yeah. This could be a 24 hour thing. For this, this makes me reflect about certainly for me and, and things that I have to continue doing or I need to do, you know, my brain goes a million miles an hour. So, um, what else I can do to, you know, become better servant to my people, to our customers, all those things that, you know, you start to speak it and you start to talk about it and then you start to write it down. You start to put plans together. You start to execute. It's, uh, it's, it's, Pretty cool. Long-term planning, though. I, I don't want to forget to say that there is such a good energy at your office. I mean, from the first time I went over there to pick something up, I mean, the facility is cool. You have the water features and all the different stuff going on, but even the uh, office manager, whoever's in the front, uh, greeted me. Super nice, cool, smiling, took care of me. And I'm just seeing in all these rooms, like, shit's just going down. You could just tell. You can <laughs> feel the energy. Beehive. Like, you know, designing over here, people on the phones over here, and then across the street, you've got, you know, two or three stories over there of people probably designing over there, yep. right? Designing, just the, the creativity is crazy. we got some good people, some new people. Yesterday, I mentioned I had a, a marketing meeting, but the marketing re really was focused on our customers and, you know, who they are. And it was just kind of fun. We're looking out through the rest of the year. What are we doing for our customers through the rest of the year? My, I, I came in Monday I'm like, shit, St. Patrick's Day is Friday. What are we doing for our people? And so I tell my wife, get get food in here. I'm like, but I don't really love most Irish food. So she calls around and finds... Wait, real quick. What is Irish food? Potatoes. Corned beef. Yeah, co corned corn beef. beef. So we got corned beef sliders. We got some kind of uh, Guinness stew coming in. They've got, nice. um, I don't know, they've got all kinds of stuff that... Some of it was like a Irish mac and cheese. I don't know what it all is, but she found somebody who's going to put it all together. They're delivering it Friday just for everybody in the company. Again, because I, I wouldn't be here without my people. Um, they're super important to me, and I, I can't say thank you to them enough. All my techs in the field. Um, I Man, I could go down the list. I can't even name them all, but uh, um, I, I sometimes I don't know how to say thank you enough. You know, it, and, and so just to my people, and hopefully they carry that spirit out to our customers to say thank you as well and to, you know, these incredible builders who give us this opportunity. And, um, and I've said this before, when I explain to people, people, what do you do? Man, I get to sit and listen to somebody tell me their dream. They're going to tell me their dream of what they want to do at their home, in their backyard, and then I get to design it, and we get to build it, and we get paid to do it. It's kind of fun. Not a bad gig. <laughs> and we get to maintain it. That's awesome. There's my highlight clip. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Let's jump into a couple of these end of end of interview. These are kind of just quicker, fun. Um, 
Dan, I always like to ask, you know, we're all in the pool biz. We all see a, a bunch of pools. What's your favorite pool you've ever been to? This can be backyard, <laughs> resort, different country. What's your the one that sticks out? <clears throat> Probably currently. Um, there's one one in Cabo San Lucas that I really really like. Gosh, it's uh, my wife was just there. I can't remember the name of the resort. Oh, but it's a uh, shit in Sabo and uh, Cabo is insane. It's the yeah, resorts they have there. There's one that was uh, at the Westin, and that's 1996 all tile pool. Overlooks the ocean, negative edge, really well done. Loved the feel of the tile on my feet. It was larger tile, not one by ones, but they were maybe like three by three tile. And just the way it felt on my feet was super cool. Um, the way it looked over the ocean and you know, swimming up to the edge and just watching the waves was super cool. And there's another one, um, It's I think it's called Grand Solomar. Um, were the large tiles just on the floor? The whole pool was the all large pool? tile. But it just the way it felt because you know smaller tile you, you feel it differently. We actually tried to play volleyball and you slipped and slided, but it just felt so good on your feet as compared to a Pebble Tech, right? Yeah. Um, not the best feeling if you've been in there or you're playing hard. Um, oh, what's I forget the name of the but at Grand Solomar over in, in uh, Cabo has a really really cool pool. Um, everything about it just it, it's got a super good flow, um, very relaxing, very calming, um, and I, I think that's what you want. You know, you getting into pool. What's the function of the pool? What's the purpose of the pool? You know, today for me, um, I want to enjoy. I want to relax. I want to decompress. And a pool that gives that to me is is a really good feeling. So um, those are some of the better ones. There's one in Costa Rica as well that uh, sits up on a cliff, Tulumar, Tulumar bung bungalows. And gosh, that was like 1997. I went to that pool. Yeah, that one's Grand Tulumar. What's I forget the. Uh, Ownership group. Oh, okay. Yeah, that one right there. I'm going to tell you a quick story about this one. This is a super cool story. Funny. <coughs> okay, so <clears throat> I was in... Uh, there you go, book a trip. I'm going to show you, I'll tell you two stories about this one fast. One story, I had been in Utah about a year earlier, and a gentleman was touring me through high-end residential in Utah. And he takes me through this neighborhood where these homes were so big, palatial mansions. I've seen big homes. These homes blew me away. It would take me two or three pictures while we're driving by to get the, the home in my, in my photo. Massive homes. And the guy driving me, uh, he says, uh, and, and that home right there is the, he was the, what do you call it, the... Uh, um, manager for Justin Bieber. Wow. And he managed all kinds of people, whatever. Okay. So fast forward a year or two later, I'm in the pool here I'm swimming around my wife and I, we're chatting and, and I'm, I'm pretty social. And, uh, there's this guy just kind of seemed different. Right. And so, um, end up kind of bumping into him, talking to him and we're talking, oh, where do you live? Oh, we live in Utah, we're in Arizona. And we're just chatting it up. And, um, I said, you know, he said, what do you do? And I tell him what I do and said, what is it that you do? And, and he says, ah, you're not going to, he won't believe me. Like now I'm interested <laughs> and now I'm going to get it out of him. I'm going to get it out of him. And so I'm, now I keep quitting. No, 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 no. And he, this went on for probably 10 minutes and I'm going, I'm going to fucking find out what this guy does. So he says, well, I used to manage Justin Bieber. I'm like, you're fucking kidding me. And he's like, see, I, you wouldn't believe me. I said, no, hold on. I'll find out. And I go over, I swim over, I get my phone. I come back with my phone. I show him pictures. I said, is that your house? He's like, how did you get pictures of my house? And so I, I tell him the story. You know, this is what I'm doing. This is why I'm traveling to Utah. I'm doing design up there. And it was the guy who was the manager of Beaver. So that was kind of cool up there. Small world. Um, yeah. What's that guy's name? Spencer something? Yeah, something like that. I, um, th that was, that was kind of funny. Um, and then one of my guys almost drowned in the ocean there too, but at lands in, um, at, at the, the grand Solomar there, he, uh, 
fun. It, there's red flags everywhere on the beach. You can't swim. Scooter Braun, that's it. Yeah, so that's him. So it says you can't swim in the ocean there. And one of my guys, we're, we're like swimming out to the edge of the pool. And he's like, I think I can do that. And he was a good swimmer, surfer, everything else. And he's like, I'm going to go for it. And he jumps the wall after a few drinks, oh, jumps the wall, jumps in. He almost drowns. We had to run out there and grab him, pull him out of the ocean. And um, but I almost drowned on my honeymoon. Did you really? Yeah. Oh, wow. I'm a strong swimmer. What happened? I was scubing, uh, not scuba, snorkeling. And I, <clears throat> you would dive down really far, come back up. And then you know how you got to blow to get the water Black that out? Would, yeah. And I tried to blow and I didn't get it all out. And then I had to take a breath and I took the water in. And, and I was probably 150 feet offshore. And it's so funny. It, it like set the tone for my whole marriage because I looked at Jen and she's like right there. And I'm like trying to signal to her that I'm in distress. And she's like frolicking in the water. <laughs> didn't even know. So I just like put my head down and just swam. And it, we were in Maui and where the water, like uh, where we were doing the snorkeling was very deep, like, I don't know, 50 feet deep or something. And then you get up and then all of a sudden it like comes up and you can stand. And I just swam as hard as I could to get there. And I just remember looking at her and I was like, almost died. You didn't even look at me. You didn't even look at me. Like it was crazy. I almost died. Damn. That's yeah. Rough. That's a cool so, place. I like Maui. So these are some of your favorite pools. Yeah. That was a really cool pool. That was uh just the setup, you know, the environment, uh, the way it exposed out to the ocean, um, the waves are beautiful. The waves when they would crash, I think the last day we were one of the first times I was there, um, there were probably 12 foot waves crash. It sounded like a bowling alley. The waves were coming down so hard, but just to hang out at the, you know, the negative edge overlooking the, the cliff and looking at it, really, really pretty. The sound of waves is like the best sound. Yeah. Unless you're at like Mavericks or something and it sounds like bowling alley yeah. fireworks in the your ear but white noise yeah um so what's a favorite pool that your team has built or you've built and it can be i know you do pools and landscape so you know it, it, there, there's probably one that uh i don't know if i really have a favorite and it, it really goes back to that frank lloyd right it's going to be my next one and i just i don't feel i've i've found my favorite I've had some that I really enjoyed and I like them for the time, but I don't go back to it that that's got to be it. It's always got to be, it's got to be the next one. You know, if you've had, if you're a car guy, you got this car, but the new one's out. Oh, and there's, and you know, it just keeps going. And so I guess well, what's the one pool, if somebody in. were to come up to you and say, what do you do? Oh, I do this. Do you got anything tough one? you can show me? I, probably a tough one was, uh, Okay, I'll make the story quick. Um, one of the highest homes on the east side of Camelback Mountain, a uh, very wealthy lady bought a home and there was a very, very small pool that was in the backyard. Justin will remember this one. Daybreak. Yep, and uh, very difficult pool. And I'm sitting up there with a guy, a very wealthy guy. He's, got, he's had this pool for 10 years. He built the home. But he's, he's elderly, he wants to move on. She wants a much bigger pool, the lady going to buy the home. Uh, very intelligent research lady. <clears throat> so she wants to build a bigger pool, but there's no room to build a pool. So I had to look at the side of the mountain and where we could, could build a new pool. And we start looking at this and I see a way it could be done, but I don't know if it all can be done because of hillside ordinances in the city of Phoenix are super, super restrictive. And so even not, not knowing everything that we have to do, because there is literally, you looked up the mountain. I don't know how high up the mountain that was, but maybe 500 feet up the mountain, the mountain continued all the way up like 500 feet. And in a, a V, a gully, the mountain came right down where we had to build the pool. So in order to build the pool, we had to build the pool like a bridge. And so we, we anchored on one side and we spanned all the way across this huge wash and anchored the pool on the other side of a point on the mountain and allowed all the water of the mountain to come underneath the pool. So I, you know, I'm, I'm six foot tall. I could walk right underneath the entire pool underneath this whole gully wash. So the pool was literally built like a bridge as a negative edge. Um, it, was, it was a really wild pool. But what was crazy about it is I remember one day she called me and she said, I want to go ahead with the pool. It was very expensive at the time. I want to go ahead with a pool. 
and I'm going to buy the house. So let's see what it's, it's going to take to get this going. And I'm buying the house because you're going to build that pool. I said, I can't guarantee you I'm going to build this pool because I haven't even gone through the city and, and all the, the hillside guidelines. And she's telling me, I think you'll figure it out. And I, I wanted the project, it was a big project at the time, and but I was afraid. So I stayed up all night and I read every single criteria of all hillside guidelines to make sure I knew everything I was doing in design. And designed the pool as this reverse cantilevered pool with a bridge underneath it, negative edge. Um, we built it, she was a super intelligent woman. Uh, all the engineering that was put together to do this, she read the engineering and questioned my people with absolute confidence of every detail about the engineering. She knew exactly what was going on, super sharp lady. Um, but uh, that was a very challenging pool, a scary one to build because I didn't know if I could build it. And when I was done, I think I had like, it was a several acre lot. I think it, she maybe she had three or four acres, four acres I think on the side of the mountain, you know, 170,000 square feet of the mountain, but she couldn't disturb more than 20,000 square feet of the mountain. And I think we're like 19,700 square feet in my design that I disturbed to get everything there. So we're like right there on the, the border. But uh, pool came together, um, turned out great. Just kind of a you know, crazy one. That was, a, that was probably one of the more intense ones I had to do. So. Fun story. You've been to this pool. This, really? this is where we took Jimmy Smith photography dude that's exactly what i was thinking but i was like nah it's probably not that one but um if you knew the story behind it's crazy it was that it, is a steep big ass driveway oh ron's been there too yeah we had to we had to huck it up we the could, side you, of the mountain you couldn't go up the driveway real quick funny story about that pool a rock came down the mountain and folded all the steel in on top of the plumbing and we had to fix it oh no shit you don't remember that no you had like 13 guys jackhammering that boulder for like a week to break it up to get oh out of the pool. yes yeah how did that happen it's just a boulder came, you know, it's it's a freaking rock hill. I mean, there's nothing, it's but, nothing but boulders up yeah. that hill. And there was probably a boulder the size of like half of a Volkswagen bug that came down and went into the pool when it had steel and plumbing. Oh. And yeah, it just devast it folded the steel in. They had to re-steal it and we had to re-plumb everything. It broke. But yeah, they could, there was no way to get it out. So Dan had a whole fleet of his guys up there with jackhammers with point that's just breaking it into pieces small enough to throw it out. Thank God nobody was down there. I mean, that would yeah. kill somebody. <clears throat> Yeah, it was an intense project. Talk. I remember planning the project and, and how many times we would need a crane to lift everything up, but our space was so limited. And we're like, well, how much are we going to be able to get there? Well, maybe, you know, two pallets of material. Well, that's going to cost me $3,500 to get it up there. And I'd think about it and go, you know what? I could probably pay a couple guys like three days to like burrows and take it up the hill and it would cost me you know half that so we 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 never used a crane only because it was it was totally inefficient so we started we ended up wearing a path up that hill just to get up there because you couldn't drive up there and go through the house to get there you had to go up the hill the other crazy part about that one is because it was so difficult to get to the city never made us put fencing around it Hmm. Yeah, What's think about point? it. It's probably more dangerous to get to the pool than it is to right? fall off the pool. Seriously. So we never had to put fencing around it. There, there is no fencing around <coughs> it. Excuse me. Oh, yeah. Crazy, crazy. So do you have, you know, one, two, three books that you would recommend? Are you a big reader? I Audio I, books? No, I used to be. I I, I actually did. Uh, you know, Good to Great, um, that, was, uh, that was a great book just you know kind of you're a good company but what's the what's the difference between a good company and a great company and always trying to become better not satisfied with you know we put out our product and it is what it is um that's what you get um really trying to become better how do you differentiate yourself from all the other companies and that was that was impactful to me um, but I probably, for me personally, um, not as much of the books, but it's my mindset focus. My, my mindset has to be positive. Um, I can't have negativity around me. If there's negativity around me, I got to get rid of it. Um, 
If it's in my office, I got to get rid of it. Um, if somebody's not happy, if you're not happy here, I want to find a place that you can be happy. And if it's not here, it's got to be someplace else because I can't have that negatively impact the direction that we're going. And if your your thinking is negative, um, I just can't be around it. It's uh, so everything around me has got to be what can happen, what is possible, how you solve the problem, um, what is possible, where we can go. Um, you know, uh, humility to, um, you know, the good things in life. I've 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 done well, but there's been periods in life. There was a period in life that, um, you know, I, I was scraping for everything I had, and at those periods though. I always reflected back on the good things that I have, no matter how small it is, um, what I'm grateful for. You know, so whether it's your your wife or your kid, or you had a great meal um, that you've got, you know, you woke up that morning, whatever it is, you gotta you gotta focus on what's good because you know, going down that path of what's wrong, why what I don't have, what they owe me, um, blah blah blah, why I'm in this position you're responsible to make it happen. You're responsible to make, to make the change. And when you can kind of connect with, you know, the power of your mind, that your mind is, uh, you can do anything that you want, um, believe in that and go for it. You have to do the work. Are we related, uh, allowed to say work? That's a dirty word. <laughs> um, you got to do the work, you know, and if you're willing to do the work, you can, you can do anything you want to. You've got to believe that. And if you don't, it's not going to happen. Nobody's going to deliver it to you. I don't care what book you read, what seminar you go to. Um, no, you go to a seminar, you hire consultants. I've been through all that. They don't do the work for you. You got to do the work. And if you're willing to do it, if you're willing to put the work in, it's going to happen. You know, if you want to lose 20 pounds and get ripped, um, go to the gym, eat right, go do the work. It'll happen. But if you don't do it, it's not going to happen. Nobody's going to do it for you. The trainer's not going to do it for you. They might coach you to do it. But they're not going to do it. They're not going to come and get you out of bed, feed you, do all those things. You have to do the work. And if you're willing to do it, everything is possible. And, and that I do believe. That's awesome. I don't even know what else to say after that. Actually, I do want to say, do you have any, what do you use for inspir inspiration? I mean, are there movies, shows, magazines? You're talking about Architectural Digest. Travel. I mean, travel. <clears throat> travel. Food. I, I don't watch much TV. Um, I, it's probably been two months since I've, I've had a TV on my house. Um, I don't watch much TV. No sports. Uh, I do watch motocross. Okay. Motocross, racing. I like I like racing. Um, it, kind of adrenaline things. I I, I do, but uh, I, I do watch motocross. Big big fan of it. Um, you know, F one racing super cool, but uh, motocross is definitely my number one. Um, you going to Vegas? No, I, 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 we do have a, uh, a big event at, at the motocross this year that'll be here at uh, whatever it's called, State Farm Stadium right now. Um, and there's there's a couple friends that I have in the industry, and, and I do ride. Um, it's been you know, probably a couple of months since I've, I've ridden, but I used to ride probably three, four times a month up until last last couple of years. Um, I really enjoy riding, love it, um, every aspect of it. It's, it's a grueling sport difficult, challenging. Um, it's you and a bike. You can't blame anybody else. You know, in the company at the end of the day, I got to blame myself. I'm, I'm responsible. And, you know, you got to take responsibility. You got to put in the work. You know, the guys that win, um, they got to go do the work and they got to be willing to um, be disciplined and make the sacrifices to, you know, succeed. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting sport. Um, it's kind of one of those weird niche sports most people don't know about. But it's one I've, I just I fell in love with and, and I like because it's uh, it's everything. It's 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 a it's a tough sport, you know. Yeah, those are real athletes, hundred percent. It's really, um, a lot of work. They, they, they say soccer guy. Those guys are some of the um, most fittest athletes in the world. Motocross guys are actually one right there. And you're like, well, wait a minute. They sit on a bike and they twist the throttle. If you actually look it up, they're they're the, some of the most fittest athletes in the world. Um, you know the endurance. Um, they try and keep their heart rate at like 190 beats per minute for 45, 40, 42 minutes straight continuously at an anaerobic exercise. It's just, uh, it's crazy. And if you see these guys that are walking around, they are ripped and they're strong. So, Shit, really we got cool. reminded of that not too long ago. <laughs> well, 
Me, you, and Brosy going out. <laughs> you guys go. He's ride. like, nope, that wasn't me. Dude yeah. went out for like a few hours or something like that, but just bouncing around in quicksand for thirty oh, minutes. Oh yeah, we took some bikes up to um, yeah 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 up by uh, is that Bar- uh, Bartlett? Yeah, yeah, Bartlett Lake. And we went down in the washes. Holy, Holy shit! shit. I grew up yeah. on dirt bikes. I haven't been on a bike since I was probably sixteen. It's fun, man. I I was yeah we were dead. toast. Yeah, it's fun, but it, mostly it's just just the track motocross supercross is um, fun and just uh, you know guys that I look up to that um, and, you know the the guys of you know thirty years ago different the guys today are a uh, um, whole nother level of um, highly disciplined athletes that it's just food diet exercise training discipline, is next level focus um, you know watching you know their 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 race and everything just critiquing themselves to to grow it's it's super super cool yes love it all right well thank you so much dan i appreciate you being on the show this was an amazing interview i'm sure everybody's notepads are completely filled up so thank you look forward to having you back here in the studio all right man greg justin thank you a lot of respect for uh mr Bowie. worked with you for a long time greg getting to know you over the last couple hours uh last couple weeks uh it's actually been uh, pretty enjoyable and what you guys have for studio this is this is a really amazing place this is uh super super cool i could hang out here thank Coming you from a design guy that's yeah. awesome thanks dan <laughs> thank you yeah.